This is chapter 5, section 2, and you have a test on Friday. This Friday, before fall break, over both sections 1 and 2. So let's get started with the new equations. The first one is dealing with the kinetic energy. It's 1 half mv squared. m is mass. What do you think mass is measured in? Kilograms. And V is for speed. What do you think speed is measured in? Meters. Meters per second. So if you don't think you can remember that, mass is going to be in kilograms. Speed is in meters per second. What is going to be our unit for kinetic energy? It's kilograms times meters squared over second squared. What do you think that's going to be equal to? So kilogram, ooh, not that. Kilograms times meter squared over second squared. That's going to be the same as, what do you think? Newton was kilogram times meter over second squared. Yesterday we talked about work, um, kinetic energy, we're going to involve that with our work today, and it is, I, I heard it, it is joules. It is joules. So again, uh, make sure you know how to derive one set of equation or one set of units to equal another set of units, and there you go for joules. Moving on. <laughs> Bless you. Kinetic energy is energy of motion. Both of these cars are moving, so they both have kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends on both the velocity of an object and its mass. Kinetic energy is calculated by multiplying mass by velocity squared and dividing by two. If the red and green car each have the same mass, the red car has more kinetic energy because it is moving faster. Even though the truck and the red car both have the same velocity, the truck has more kinetic energy because it has more mass. So when we were talking about the relationship between force, mass, and acceleration, uh, this is taking a little bit different turn. This is talking about energy, mass, and instead of acceleration, it's speed. So again, that very last one it was showing, if they have the same speed, but whichever one has more mass, you'll have more kinetic energy. So, so you can also make a relationship there between what's considered direct. So if we're looking back at the PowerPoint, the work kinetic energy theorem. Uh, the equation that goes with this particular theorem is there at the bottom. Your net work by all forces, remember net, you have to include every force you've got, is equal to the change in the object's kinetic energy. And that little delta sign there does mean a change in kinetic energy. So what you could do at this point is uh, think about the equation that we just looked at, your kinetic energy. You could have kinetic energy of two different objects or an initial and final kinetic energy of your singular object and compare those. We're going to look at the video and it's going to spell this out for you how you can rewrite that last equation. Work done on a moving object is equal to the change in its kinetic energy. For example, a hammer can be used to drive a nail into a piece of wood. The hammer has a certain kinetic energy as it begins to strike, and a different kinetic energy when it comes to rest against the nail. The difference in the two kinetic energies is equal to the work done on the hammer by the nail. The kinetic energy of an object can therefore be thought of as the work it can do or can have done on it, if the mass or the velocity of the object changes. Because the force on the hammer by the nail is opposite the displacement of the hammer, the work done on the hammer is negative. However, the work done by the hammer on the nail is positive because the force of the hammer on the nail and the displacement of the nail are in the same direction. The kinetic energy of an object can be thought of as the work it can do as it comes to rest. Okay, so thinking about what she just stated, 
she said that the kinetic energy can be thought of as the work it can do whenever it comes to rest. Uh, typically, what's the speed of an object as it comes to rest? Zero. Zero. So whenever the hammer stops, you're going to be at rest then. Uh, that equation that you see at the top, though, your network equals one-half mass times VF squared minus VI squared. Again, if you're talking about the same object, you can have additional a, um, a different initial and final velocity. So make sure you know delta means a change in. It's always final minus initial. And both of those are squared. So I would write down that top equation that you see. The, the one-half. Yes. That one right there. Write down that equation. That's a different, uh, just a different form of the work kinetic energy theorem. It's spelling out for you what uh, delta Ke is. And in the example that they gave us here, if it said work is you either have on or by, and you just have to pick your object. So in the scenario that was given here, I'm changing up one word. Work is either done on the hammer or work is done by the hammer. So in which of those two cases would work be a positive number? If work is done on the hammer or if work is done by the hammer? By, by, by. by the hammer is positive. If work is done on the hammer, it is going to be negative. That's just for this particular scenario. Any questions? Let's go through this example, and again, the PowerPoint's going to work all of this out for you, but we'll work it out ourselves. On a frozen pond, a person kicks a 10-kilogram sled, giving it an initial speed of 2.2 meters per second. How far does the sled move if the coefficient of kinetic friction between the sled and the ice is 0 0.10? And again, you can leave your PowerPoint right there on the problem itself. I'm going to go ahead and move. Uh, I would label everything first, maybe even give a drawing. What are some of the things that were given? What is it? Ten kilograms. What else is given? How are we going to label initial speed? VI. VI. 2.2 meters per second. What else? I'm here in UK. Y'all agree? What is it? Point one. And it wants us to find how far does the sled move. So what are we actually looking for? Distance. distance. We're looking for distance. If you were to draw this out, um, they have a diagram that was on the PowerPoint. But this is our sled. I'm just going to draw a box right here. Force due to kinetic friction. We'll assume the sled is moving what we consider to be a positive direction in that direction right there. So that is the distance that the sled is going to go. Also in that distance is your initial velocity. And you have the mass. Um, but if UK is given, what else do we need? Force of kinetic friction. And that is going to be in the opposite direction. Force due to kinetic friction is in the opposite direction. Now, it's one that's to find distance. We have lots of information that is given. Um, you know, if we got mass and we have initial velocity, do we have a final velocity? What's eventually going to happen to the sled? It's going to stop. So we really do have a final velocity also. So final velocity is going to be zero. Based on, I see, I'm looking at just my symbol so I can figure out what am I going to do with this. I see M, V, I, V, F, U, K, and D. Based on what we just talked about, what are we probably going to do with the velocities? 
Okay, so I'm just going to write that down. I know that we can use that with work. Network is delta KE, which was one half M, the F squared minus VI squared. And what can I mark out of that as it is? VF squared. So you end up with negative one half M VI squared. So I know we can use that. Uh, what else? What would you use to find that? Okay. And I'm going to, let me do it because I know in the PowerPoint it kind of does it separate, but it doesn't really show you the detail of how they get to that. Um, if I'm going to use my UK, right, which equals FK over FN. I need to rearrange that. Why do we need to rearrange it? Okay. Normal force. Let's talk about normal force. Is it given? No, but we can figure it out or solve it in this problem because if I'm looking, even though my normal force technically is going up, in this particular example, because everything's level, we're not working with an angle, that is equal to what? It's also equal to force due to gravity. It, the magnitude of it is equal to force due to gravity. So if we know that Fn is equal to force due to gravity, I can go ahead and plug that in over here. It's equal to Fk over, what equation would we use for force due to gravity? Mass times acceleration. So there's mg. Now we've not solved for uk, or in this one we have uk, but we don't have fk. So in the PowerPoint you will see that they rearrange this, and they are going to get fk by itself. So ignore this for right now get FK by itself, what is the equation going to look like? It's going to look like UK times M times G. Who has a question? Yes. Because in this, your object is on a uh, horizontal surface that there's no angle. There's no angle whatsoever applied. So in the vertical direction, those forces are going to cancel out and equal zero. Yeah. Where does Fn come from? Because the normal force is equal to mass times acceleration. Right. Okay. Since normal force in this example is equal to F of G, we can just replace your normal force here with F of G. So I skipped a spot, going from normal force to F of G to M times G equals F of G. So I did skip it. I mean, what would you have done? Okay. Well, I want you to see why it works in this example, because it won't always work. In this example, it goes back to Zach's question of, well, how did you find normal force? So having to re-explain why you can do it in this problem, but not just any problem. Now, I've got an equation for network. I have an equation for F of K. And again, I have my UK. I have my mass. I have acceleration due to gravity. So I can solve for F of K. But what can I do with that information? What, do, what ultimately do I need to find? Distance. You need to find distance. Do we have an equation that uses distance? We do, and I heard it. I heard work equals force times.
times distance. You can add the cosine theta in there. Do we need cosine theta in this problem? No. Why not? Well, what is our angle in this problem? It's a horizontal surface. Okay. We have a horizontal surface in this problem. Uh, the force that we're going to end up putting in here is force due to kinetic friction, right? That's going to go right there. Look at FK and D. Look at the angle between them. What's the angle? The angle is 180. Okay? So the angle that we're looking at is 180 degrees. What is cosine of 180? Negative 1. So remember that. We'll leave it in there, but it's going to be negative 1. So again, that FK is going to be plugged in for F in that work equation that we were just looking at. FK and distance, they are moving in opposite directions, so that's why we're using cosine of 180 degrees. Let's go work it out. Which of these are you going to start with? Which one do you want to solve for first? Or do you even have to solve for one first? In the PowerPoint, they're not actually going to solve. They're just going to take everything we've rearranged and then put it into a final equation. You can do that way, or you can do some multiple solving steps in the middle. Which way do y'all want to do it? Multiple solving steps. What are we going to solve for first? Okay. What's the equation? Negative one half m vi squared. Well, yeah. Go back and look. Look at this one. Vf is zero. I'm looking at the top at what's in yellow. Vf is zero, so that negative, I've just moved the negative to the beginning. Okay? Plug in your information. Mass was, what was mass? Ten kilograms. Ten kilograms. Velocity initial was two point two. That number is squared. What do you get for work? Say it again. Do y'all agree 24.2? I don't have the intermediate stuff. 24.2. What's the unit? Joules. Okay. Now what are we going to solve for? Work is... Say that again. Work equals FD cosine theta. Okay. FD cosine theta. So work 24.2 joules. Uh, what are we plugging in for force? Do y'all want to solve for force? Yes. Okay, let's solve for it then first. Force equals UK times M times G. UK was point 0.2. Is that right? Point 0.1. 10 kilograms and G, 9.81 meters per second squared. So what is FK? Point eight one. Jules. Well, hey, uh, he's bringing up a good question. He said, why don't we put in the negative for the 9.81? Or I guess I just drop it. Tell me, should the, should the negative be in there for the 9.81? Well, I mean, it, it does, but tell me, yes or no? 
If you're going to say no, tell me why it's no. No. Let's go back and look. The acceleration matches the direction. Okay. Remember, the whole reason why we plugged in the gravity part on this one right here, and I'll circle it for you. We plugged this in in replacing normal force. Which direction is normal force going? It's in a positive direction. Yes, the magnitude is in the positive direction. You do knock the negative off because it's not force due to gravity. It's normal force, positive direction. So it does matter. There, there is a reason for it. Every time I plug in the work thing in my calculator, I get negative 24 points. Oh, we can go back a little bit to the negative. Yes. There you go. Negative right there. I put it in orange. Negative 24.2. Yes, and it is negative. Now, which equation are we using? Okay. W equals F D cosine theta. Um, work was negative 24.2. F, 9.81 joules. We're solving for D and then cosine 180 degrees. So when you solve for D, what does D equal? 2.5 meters. 2.5 meters. So see, the negatives worked out like they were supposed to. 2.5 meters. So again, I don't care which way you go about it, multiple steps or one. Okay, moving on from kinetic energy, potential energy. And we're going to have uh, a couple different types of potential energy we talk about today. Potential energy, this is energy based on an object's position, shape, or condition. First type of potential energy we're going to look at is gravitational potential energy. And this is stored in the gravitational fields of interacting bodies. And it does depend on the height of your object from whatever you consider to be your zero level. Typically, the ground is zero level. The equation you've got, potential energy, they throw a G there for gravitational potential energy equals mass of your object times free fall acceleration, that's the 9.81, times the height of your object from whatever you are considering to be your zero level. So make sure you write that down as one of the equations for today. Is sometimes known as energy of position or stored energy. One form of potential energy is gravitational potential energy. An object that is raised above ground level has work done on it. This work increases its energy. At the top of the slope, the ball is not moving, but it has the potential to do so. If it falls, the gravitational potential energy will change to kinetic energy. There are many other forms of potential energy. A piece of wood, for example, contains chemical potential energy that can be converted into heat and light when it burns. Increasing pressure along a fault line does work on the various rock layers and increases the potential energy along the line. This energy is released during an earthquake. So the, for number one, potential energy is also called stored energy. But it gave some examples there too. Uh, one was dealing with wood and the other was with earthquakes. It says wood has stored chemical energy. I mean, we've got chemical energy within us too. So if you burn it, it's going to... Uh, release its stored chemical energy. And then the example with the earthquake, it does have stored potential energy that is released during an earthquake. The other type of potential energy we're going to look at is elastic potential energy. They give you an equation for it. This is when you um, have deformed an elastic object and then it returns to its original configuration and that equals one-half kx squared. Um, the k is a spring constant. It depends on the type of spring that's used, how stiff that spring is, the material that it's made out of. Uh, 
you wouldn't memorize values for spring constants. So you could go find values given for spring constants. It's not something that you memorize. It's either given to you or you're solving for it. And then x is the distance compressed or stretched. Distance compressed or stretched. The units for the spring constant. This one's not unitless. Uh, the units for spring constant are Newton over meter. Newton over meter. And we're going to look at some examples as the PowerPoint goes on. And this diagram right here, basically they're showing you a block of wood that is coming from the side. Uh, springs, it's kind of kind of weird watching springs work, anything but vertical. But anyways, you've got one coming from the side, a uh, piece of wood, and it shows you a compressed length and then a relaxed length. And then it shows you how you would find distance compressed versus its relaxed length. Newton over meter. So let's go look at a video. Constant determines how much force a spring will exert for a given compression or expansion. For example, if we attach one kilogram weights to each of these springs, we see that they stretch different amounts. The larger the spring constant, the stiffer the spring, and the more force that is required to stretch it. The spring constant depends on the type and amount of material a spring is made of and how the spring is formed. A couple things that they stated here. Um, it says K is for a given compression or expansion. Depends on, again, your spring. But if you have a stiffer spring, what does that mean for your spring constant? Higher or lower? Higher. It's higher. So a stiffer spring, you're going to see a higher constant. Let me show you an example of what a spring scale is. Okay, so let's go through this particular example. Uh, we were looking at gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy. In this example, it says you've got a 70 kilogram stuntman is attached to a bungee cord with an unstretched length of 15 meters. How are we going to use that unstretched length? Well, that is the relaxed length. Okay, it's not compressed or stretched. That's the relaxed length is the 15 meters. He jumps off a bridge spanning the river, a height of 50 meters. When he finally stops, the cord has a stretched length of 44 meters. Treat the stuntman as a point mass. Disregard the weight of the bungee cord. Assuming the spring constant of the cord, 71.8 newton over meter, what is the total potential energy relative to the water when the man stops falling? Um, I know that they do give you something, but we're, we're going to go work it out ourselves. Steven's excited. Um, let's start with everything that was given. What was given? Mass of 70 kilograms. What else? Okay, length relaxed. Um, I know that we're going to need that. How do you think we're going to use it? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and put right here relaxed length, maybe. That was how long? 15 meters? Okay. Uh, the height is 50 meters, so we're going to call that H. That's the height of the bridge. And the cord stretches a length of 44 meters. Stretches 44 meters. Mm -hmm. 
And how are we going to write this out? 71.8 newton over meter. K. Okay. That's our spring constant. And it wants us to find the total potential energy. So I'm going to put PE total for what is going on here. Why do I need to put PE total? Could be two different ones. We're probably going to have to find the potential energy that's according to gravitational potential energy and elastic potential energy. We're going to have to find both of those. And again, gravitational potential energy, what's the formula for it? MGH and elastic. Okay, so that X, um, it looks like we're going to have to find out whatever this X is. What is the X supposed to represent? Just the distance The distance that your spring stretches or compresses. Are we stretching or compressing in this example? Stretching. We are stretching it. Now, the wording is a little shady in this one, but if we look at the drawing that they have, okay, here's our bridge. Here's the water below the bridge. Our bungee cord is already at 15 meters. And it says that it stretches 44 meters. So our X is really what? Okay. I'm going to write that down below. X is really... You've got 44 meters that it stretches minus the 15 in its relaxed state. So X is 29 meters. Also, if it's from the bridge to the water, which is 50 meters, this distance right here is 50 meters. Where do we actually stop? Six meters from the water. You stop six meters from the water. Because if it stretches down to 44 meters right here, 50 minus 44 is 6. So that distance above the water is 6 meters. Okay. What are we going to use for that, the 6 meters there? That is going to be used as our height. This is what's due to gravity. Your mass times gravitational acceleration times the height. And if I go back and look at the definition for what is H, it says it depends on the height from zero level. That's why we're subtracting those two. That's why we're not using 50 meters all the way from the bridge. It's the height from zero level, and your bungee cord actually stops six meters above the water. So H is six meters. So I've also got H. I've got X. So we did use this information that was over here, but we had to manipulate it to get what we actually needed. Given everything you see on this page right here, can you plug in MGH and can you plug in 1 half K and X squared and solve? Okay, you go ahead and plug in all of your information. Once you get each part, how about um, the gravitational and then the elastic, and then you can give me a final answer on top of that. Okay. Yep. I'm miss okay, we can talk later. Anybody already found gravitational potential energy? What'd you say? 4,120. 4,120 joules. And let's see here. One half KX squared. Anybody found elastic potential energy? What'd you say? For elastic? No, what'd you get? 30,191. 30,191? 30,191 joules. Anybody else get that? Okay. 
So what is our total potential energy after we add everything up? Uh, he's rounding on us 3.4 times 10 to the fourth joules. So again, I think the hardest thing in this one was just picking out the given information and then putting proper labels on given information. This is potential energy. I mean, it's think about it as being stored energy. You're not really looking at a positive or negative value when you're talking about stored energy. I mean, it's available energy. But yeah, there's no <laughs> negatives in any of this. Uh, it depends on the spring, that spring constant that was given. Uh, the spring constant given in this one was, yeah, 71.8. So, I mean, that's a stiffer spring. I mean, you got to think about a person jumping off of something. Yeah, it depends on the K. Yes. Yep. I want you to do number one on this page, and then we'll have a couple more examples after this. Calculate the speed, and it gives you the mass of the airliner and its kinetic energy. Once you get an answer, let me hear it. Yeah, just make sure when you're working through that, once you get to your V, you got to take the square root since it's squared originally. Any questions on this one? So we're going to move on to another one. On this page, I want you to do number four. This deals with the work kinetic energy theorem. Number four. I know I already heard the answer from one person, but again, uh, the first thing I did when I was looking at this stuff in my mind, I knew what I had given, but I wrote out <clears throat> the equation to find the force which was the W equals F times D. And since we don't have work, I backtracked and said, well, to find work, I do have enough information for the work kinetic energy theorem. So I started with this first to find work and then plug that into the second equation, W equals F times D to find force. Who's got a question? Yeah. On this one, you're going to work out number two, and this one is dealing with potential energy. The, do you, you can look up here to see how I've worked this one out. You just got to make sure you put in your calculator right. Subtract first, then square that number. Oh, I 